Good morning again, everyone. We welcome you into this time of worship at Cairn Christian Church. We are here at Cairn, an open and affirming Green Chalice anti-racism congregation of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, and we welcome all people into our midst. I want to special, say a special welcome to any who are with us this morning as guests. You are so welcome into this space and time with our community. I also want to let you know that during our worship today, we will not be sharing our joys and concerns. Please feel free to, to put those in our um, chat if you would like to. Um, or you can send those to me and Alana um, following worship. And we're going to instead um, remember uh, the events of this week, the shootings in Boulder, uh, the trauma to our community. Um, we did have our service on Wednesday night, um, but we wanted to share that with those who could not be there, not the entire service, but the remembrance of the victims. Our invitation to the Lenten journey. This season is a journey, a journey of outward practices and inner awareness, a journey into the center of our spirits and into God's presence, a journey of confession about our longings for God and our separation from God. A journey of abiding in God, even as God abides with us. A rock that will not move, a love that is not changed. A journey with the incarnate one on his road to Calvary. And with the marginalized ones who bear the crosses of oppression. They, that exist in every time and place. A journey to be in this world, but not of this world. A journey from winter to spring, from death to life, from darkness to light, from cold to warmth, from despair to hope, from turmoil to peace, from anguish to grace. The journey is yours to make alone and ours to make together. And on this journey, bidden or not, God is present. It's true. 
join me in prayer? Dear God, we remember that when we gather in your name, you are present among us. We bring to mind those in our church community who have been absent from our Zoom worship this past year. We see their faces and say their names and we bring them in our imagination to this space and time. For all of us, even in our far-flung spaces, our distracted minds and wounded hearts, help us to feel the grace, beauty, and energy of our community as we worship together. Amen. Trelona or Kawiak. Suzanne Fountain. Terry Liker.
Kevin Mahoney. Lynn Murray. Ricky Olds. Naven Stemisic. Denny Song. Jody Waters. Officer Eric Talley.
We come to that time in our service of abiding in God through Lectio and Visio Divina. Lectio and Visio. As I read, listen for the meaning of the text, and if you wish, draw or color in response. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Meditatio. Ponder the words or images and listen for the voice of God. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. 
but I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Oratio, open your heart to feelings and questions, and if you wish, draw or color more. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, but I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Contemplatio, let go of the activity, enter into a still place, breathe evenly. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, but I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone.
scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately, as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. A few weeks ago, I was reminded of an ancient concept, the concept of ahimsa. Ahimsa. It is a concept found in the Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain traditions, a virtue that means having respect for all living things, often translated as nonviolence. It is a concept I have studied in the past quite extensively, a virtue embraced by Mahatma Gandhi and practiced by him in a way that radically altered his personal life and the way he engaged with the world. A virtue Martin Luther King learned from Gandhi and turned into his own way of life that in turn became a nonviolent movement for civil rights. I have always called myself a struggling pacifist. I have wanted to be nonviolent. I wanted to embrace a platform of nonviolence, but I was not ever so sure that when push came to shove, I would be able to personally walk that line, or that I could truly comprehend a world without the ability to defend and protect others, especially those I love, by the use of force. I could never make a full argument against the great wars. And I had some piece of me that could see the Malcolm X approach to injustice and oppression. Nevertheless, I have spent much of my ministry since seminary inviting congregants to a movement of nonviolent resistance, nonviolent engagement in civil disobedience and civil discourse and social justice action aimed at changing oppressive systems, working alongside the marginalized and lifting up the downtrodden. But in my reading a few weeks ago, ahimsa settled into me in a new way. Do you all remember way back in Epiphany, we asked a number of our folks in the community to share a moment of epiphany, an aha moment that changed them. They shared stories of strangers at their doorsteps on Christmas Eve. 
a feeling of safety in the midst of incredible danger. Names and numbers that seem to be crying out for their attention. Conversations that reached well beyond the surface. Memories that helped them in the present. My reading about Ahimsa this time around had a similar impact on me. It's a term I have studied and known, and it suddenly reached more deeply into my core and loosened the knots in my heart, connected me to an awareness that hadn't been there before, cleared away some detritus and shadow, and I felt light and conscious and both more myself and less myself all at once. Describing aha moments is not an easy task. I do not take it lightly this morning. As I know those of you who shared in Epiphany did not take it lightly. We are all so bound up so much of the time. When the light gets in, when the tension releases, when joy and peace are known or a calling is heard or an idea becomes no longer a cognitive thought but a felt experience, time slows down and space expands and senses are both heightened and lost. No wonder we want to build temples and shrines. These moments are fleeting and we want to capture them and hold on to them and make them eternal. No wonder Peter, James and John wanted to make tents for Moses, Elijah and Jesus during the transfiguration. This epiphany, this theophany, this moment of enlightenment, it should not be lost. For the most part, we only stay in these moments for a short time. The experience fades, but perhaps a new awareness emerges that lasts far longer. I hope so. Part of what I would share this morning is simply a recognition that these moments do happen and to honor these as part of the beauty of our religious life. A place that we can share these experiences, name them, describe them, learn and grow from them. Moments that invite us beyond the limitations of our ego. Ahimsa, nonviolence. The temptation I think is wanting to change the world by changing policies, changing politicians, changing the hearts and minds of others without doing the work of changing ourselves. To see the external workings of the Gandhis and the MLKs of the world without seeing the long, hard, internal practice and struggle. To seek an end without entering into the means. To see the end result as the goal instead of the process as the goal. To think that knowing with the mind is enough when such things must be known in the spirit. To think that when we've known it once, we no longer need to pay it any attention. As if it's knowledge we have attained, when in truth, we never attain it. We only practice it. The insight settled deeply when I read that in the discipline of yoga, 
a yogini is only allowed to begin the practice once they have grasped the art of ahimsa. Treating others with nonviolent respect and compassion. From our children, to our friends, to our enemies, to our strangers. Treating creation and creatures with non-violent respect and compassion from the largest ecosystem to the smallest fly. Treating oneself with non-violent respect and compassion from the ways we treat our bodies to the way we treat our hearts, our minds, our spirits. All of which requires transcending our egos to find that essence which is common among all of creation, that goodness beyond being that is both beyond our knowing, truly transcendent, and yet present in our psyches, imminent and intimate. And that is expressed most fully and discovers most deeply in acts of love and compassion. Only then would the guru allow the yogin to even sit in the lotus position. The insight was that I always, always want to jump to the end. I want to jump not just to lotus position, but to the eight angle pose or the one-handed tree pose or the side plank pose. I want to jump to nonviolence. I want to jump to a completed manuscript. I want to jump to the most intricate banjo rolls. I want to jump to a congregation overflowing with people. I want to jump beyond the hard work of raising a teenager. I want to jump to gun control. I want to jump to being anti-racist. The insight was that every time I want to jump over or jump beyond, I am actually doing violence to myself and to others. It is the violence of impatience, the violence of unrealistic expectations, the violence of anger at myself, others, the world, God. It is the violence of shame, the violence of neglecting the practice, the process, the steps. It is the violence of pushing away the good beyond being whose transcendence and imminence are the essence of life. The violence of trying to force things into place, even good things, noble things, just things force them into place rather than cultivating lifelong practices that transform and enrich every day. The violence of self-centered egotism rather than the nonviolent practice of compassion. As the 20th century activist and mystic Thomas Merton wrote, to allow ourselves to be carried away by a multitude of conflicting concerns, to surrender to too many demands, to commit oneself to too many projects, to want to help everyone in everything is to succumb to violence. The frenzy of our activism neutralizes our work for peace. 
It destroys our own inner capacity for peace. It destroys the fruitfulness of our own work because it kills the root of inner wisdom, which makes work fruitful. When religion becomes a list of laws imposed on novices with damning consequences of shame, humiliation, and the threat of eternal punishment, it has lost its way. It has turned to the violence of expecting the novice to perform the one-handed tree pose before their spirit or their body is ready for the deeper mysteries of life and the wisdom and complexity of those laws. When religion divides us into good and bad, light and darkness, evil and righteous, strong and weak, victim and villain, wicked and virtuous, blessed and cursed, it has lost its way. It has turned to violence, reducing all of the paradoxes of life to a binary, dualistic, polarized view of the world, rather than allowing its adherents to grow a mature understanding of the paradoxes and tensions in each of us and learning to practice ahimsa with ourselves and others in all our fickle, frail, fragile, faulty selves. When religion becomes a means to an end, whether that be enlightenment or heaven, or the avoidance of eternal punishment, it has lost its way. Adopting the violence of craving or fearing the future, rather than practicing being in the present. When religion believes in a God that is an all-powerful being, whether pulling the strings of life or cold and distant, and unmovable, it has lost its way. Engaging in the violence of severing the connection between our spirits and the good beyond being. Making us slaves to an almighty being rather than exploring the presence of God right at the center of our being and all beings, enlivening everything that is. The spiritual greats have been those who walked a path of nonviolence, not just in their outward practices, but in their attention to the inward practices, cultivating their connection to that good beyond being that led them to the outward practices of nonviolence, including self-control and justice and compassion. My friends, we are at the beginning of Holy Week. Palm Sunday, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, Easter Sunday. It is a week that exposes the violence that can take hold of the human heart, the violence that can take hold of religion, the violence that is embedded in the world, the violence that is so often propagated by empire. It is a week in which we watch our own remarkable story of Ahimsa, Jesus's ministry of nonviolence, his practice of connecting to the good beyond being, his practice of compassion, his nonviolent entrance into Jerusalem, his nonviolent religious practice of the ritual of Passover, his nonviolent ritual of washing feet and sharing bread and wine, his nonviolent actions in the garden his nonviolent words in the courts, his nonviolent endurance of anguish and humiliation, even as his spirit asked to be spared. 
It is also a week in which we recognize that we have turned this nonviolent ministry and this nonviolent story into a violent theology that has scarred and traumatized individuals and the world. A violent God and a violent path to our salvation. It is a week in which we must confess the failings of our religion to live up to the life of Jesus and to the God of love. And it is a week in which we are invited to begin or continue or start over on our own journey of ahimsa, nonviolence, a lifelong practice not unlike the entry into Jerusalem, a journey in which all around us there are temptations to take the easy way, the violent way, the push and shove of power and might, the domination of ego, the resistance to being broken open, the violence of control this week. May we take the hard way. Let us enter into this journey together in a spirit of ahimsa and opening ourselves to those moments when God breaks in and heals us. Amen. Each of you should have a palm cross. They were handed out in your bags. Perhaps you have them nearby. It's always a curious thing to know what to do with our palms on Palm Sunday as we re-experience that event and wonder what it means in our lives as we struggle with the idea that perhaps it was not so triumphant an entry as has been claimed, as we remember the humility that in, went into that entry, as we remember the crowds, just like us, looking for salvation, for someone to heal us or fix us or save us. 
So we lift our palms, not in triumph, but in humility, coming before the God of love to be present in whatever struggles we are facing today. Perhaps it is all right this year that our palms are not green. Our palms are dried and folded and shaped. Perhaps it is okay that our palms come this year in the form of a cross. In the midst of COVID, in the midst of tragedy, we lift up these palms, dried, broken, shaped, awaiting the news of resurrection. And so we come to this table, lifting our cup, our bread, symbols of this new covenant in which God comes so directly to each one of us and shapes us and holds us and knows us and invites us to know God. We remember that Jesus shared a meal with his friends, a meal in which he envisioned his own brokenness and gave us these symbols so that we would always remember and be connected by our own brokenness. Let us take and receive, remembering all of God's covenant promises to us, remembering that Jesus lived his life for others in a spirit of nonviolence and joining our longings for justice and peace with those throughout the ages. Let us give thanks. God of our journeys, goodness beyond being, we come to this table with a thirst for meaning and comfort to try and make sense of suffering and to feel your peace. Sometimes though we come to this table and we don't feel and we don't understand. And so we pray to you to help us, to sustain us as we practice, to come to us in our moments of unknowing, in the moments we long impatiently for your goodness, and in this moment as we bless this bread and this cup and share in this ritual of faith and love. Amen. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, God's grace is revealed to heal our brokenness, to forgive our sins, and to set us free from all that would oppress us and let God's people say, Amen. And now let us go from this place of worship, blessed by God and blessed by this community of faith. And may you be a blessing to everyone you meet in this coming week. Amen.